All right, continuing the study of the book of Titus, we're going to finish up today. Titus chapter 3, expository study here, going verse by verse through the Bible. That's what expository means if you're newly saved and you don't know. And uh, that's what we, one of the things that we do here, do a lot of subject studies, but um, also doing some expository preaching here. And uh, so you can watch the first two if you haven't seen those. But uh, we're going to cover chapter 3 today. So Titus chapter 3, verse 1, let's get started. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Now, I, as I was studying this, this uh, chapter, I read that and I thought, that's kind of interesting, this word principalities. Because we oftentimes think about principalities as not being physical men. Let me show you what I mean. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. If you want to turn there. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So you see there in this verse, the principalities are not flesh and blood. They are spiritual beings. Very interesting. Ephesians 3.10. Turn a chapter or two over here. Actually, three chapters. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 says, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So you see again there a reference to principalities being spiritual beings. Go next to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 38. 38 through 39. We'll see another reference here. We're actually going to look at all the references in the King James Bible to the word principalities. Some interesting things here. Romans chapter 8 verse 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, there it is again, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you can see there, principalities, yes, they are spiritual, yes, they are powerful, but they cannot separate you from the love of God if you're saved. All right, They are limited in their power, in other words. So then the question comes up, are these principalities, every reference in the Bible to principality, is it always a spiritual being, an invisible spiritual being? Let's look about that. Colossians 1 verse 16. The thing you have to understand is that there are two realities essentially, and that is the physical realm, which you can see around you right now. This is all physical here, but then there's also a spiritual realm, all right? It isn't all just heaven and hell. You know, hell is actually a physical realm. Uh, there are souls down there in hell right now, but hell is a physical place. Any geology textbook will show you that. You cut the earth in half, there's a molten center. The Bible says that hell is in the heart of the earth. It is a physical place. It's not some mythical spiritual place that doesn't really exist. It's in the heart of the earth and it's burning down there. All right. Yes, the souls do go down to hell and they do burn down there. They aren't physical bodies, so they don't burn up. A soul is an eternal uh, thing. It's, it's something that does not, it's not destroyed. Okay. So don't fall for this lie that, that you know, the, the lie of annihilation, you know, that, that, you go down to hell and you burn up and real quickly and you're gone and that's it. No more remembrance of you. Uh-uh. doesn't work. All right. Hell is a literal place, a physical place. It is reality. Heaven is a place that when you get there, it will be physical. It's not going to just be mental and whatever else, but we can't see it. You can't uh, verify it in terms of um, it's not observable or demonstrable, things like that. Okay. It is a spiritual place. And in like manner, we can prove the physical world. Okay? I mean, I can pull this book out from the bookshelf. See? All right? 
it's a physical book. It doesn't take much faith to believe in that. Right? But now if I said to you that there's a devil right here or an angel right there, well, I can't just grab a hold of them and say, hey, look, see, it's the spiritual realm. So, so far we have seen principalities dwelling within that spiritual realm. It's not flesh and blood. But now let's look at this reference here, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Okay, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, now look at this, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, you see that again too, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. It's kind of interesting because by Jesus Christ, everything has life. So these people that deny, you know, the atheist fools that are out there that say, I deny the existence of God. You know, it's like an electrical appliance saying, I don't need to be plugged into the wall to work. <laughs> it's like, well, if you get unplugged from the wall, you're dead. And if you get unplugged from Jesus Christ, you're dead. And, you know, God has grace, God has mercy, God gives man free will. That's why the Lord allows these fools, these atheists, to say that they don't believe in God. They will one day, though. It's kind of interesting. But you see there, in verse 16, it says, visible and invisible. I'm going to show you about that as we continue here. Colossians 2.15. Jump over there to the next chapter. It says here, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, who did Jesus Christ uh, triumph over when he died on the cross? Uh, I mean, uh, certain people uh, sentenced him to death, and they gave him the death penalty, and he beat it. I mean, there aren't too many people who die the death of dying on the cross and come back to life. In fact, I know of only one, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. So you had... Pilate, with his illegal trial of Jesus Christ, and Herod, both those secular rulers, Jesus Christ triumphed over them. You say, well, then they were, you know, the physical flesh and blood there. Yes, but who was influencing those two men? See, that's where we're going with this thing. Principalities are influencing the politicians. It's the principalities that are in charge, that are pulling the strings behind the scenes. All right? That's something that you have to understand. That's why the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And I'm going to say something here, and please don't take this out of context and try to make me look like a bad guy. Um, the way that you get the politicians to do what's right is not by saying we need to go in there and start a war and assassinate all the politicians. Because, you see, you can get rid of the physical fleshly politicians but you're not getting rid of the principalities and powers behind them that are controlling them. So you need to understand that. If you go down in, into Washington and you clear out every, Washington, D.C., and you clear out every single corrupt politician, you didn't get rid of the principalities and powers. And they're still going to be there to take over with the next politicians that you bring in. You know, there's an old saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. And what you have is you get rid of some rotten, horrible, wicked politician that's been through all kinds of, you know, blackmailing and all kinds of things like that. He's a bad guy. And you go and you get rid of him. And the new guy comes in and he's just clean cut, really good man, really has, you know, he's a good moral character and everything else. And all of a sudden all these big multinational corporations are coming along and they're saying, hey, if uh, you look the other way, we'll give you six million dollars. Well, he make a hundred thousand a year, you know, as a politician or something. See, he's going to be corrupted, and the spiritual forces that are there are also going to start to work on him. So, when the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, it's saying, yes, there are corrupt politicians, but who is controlling the politicians? The principalities. So, why in Titus chapter three one does it say to put them in mind to be subject to principalities? Well, we're going to continue here, and I'll show you why the Bible says that. Next, we're going to go back to Jeremiah chapter 13. Here's where it gets interesting.
Back to your Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 13. I'm going to show you how principalities control politicians. Jeremiah 13. Turn into it here. Jeremiah 13, verse 18. It says here, Say unto the king and to the queen, Humble yourselves, sit down, for your principalities uh, shall come down, even the crown of your glory. Now there's a very interesting word in your King James Bible. It's E-V-E-N, also known as even. What is the interesting part about that word? When you see, many times when you see that word even, it is actually the next, the words that follow even are defining the words that precede even. Okay? Look at it here. Your principalities shall come down, even the crown of your glory. So what are the principalities? The crown of the glory of the king and the queen. See? They are the ones who are actually controlling things. The king and the queen really aren't really controlling anything. It's the principalities that are controlling them. And uh, who controls the principalities? The Lord. By him all things consist. They have to report back to their commander. Hmm. Let's look a few more verses here, some interesting stuff. Turn to the book of Daniel. Back towards your New Testament. A few books over there. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Then said he, and here in the context, by the way, I, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but this angel comes to Daniel and Daniel's scared to death and he falls on his face and he can't even speak. He's so scared. And the angel's like, hey, don't worry about it. Touches his mouth. You know, go ahead and speak. But here's what the angel says to him. Verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Look at verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king's of Persia. Wait a second. Here you have an angel of the Lord and a prince, a Persian prince of Persia is withstanding him and he needs to call in Michael, the archangel, to help him. Um, back in the Old Testament, these angels are killing thousands of men. Why would he be fighting with this prince of Persia and need help from another angel? What's going on here? We're not dealing with the prince of Persia is, yes, the physical prince, but we're dealing with a principality that is controlling the prince of Persia. Possibly even Satan himself controlling this guy. That's why this angel couldn't handle him on his own. See, the principality, even the crown of his glory there, the one who's controlling that political ruler. Now jump down to um, verse 20 here in the same chapter. Okay. See, he was fighting with him for a couple days there. It said back up in verse uh, 13 there, one in 20 days, 21 days he's there fighting, you know, with this guy. Look at verse 20. Then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. What's going on there? You're dealing with principalities. Angels and principalities fighting over things. All right? Making sure the Lord's will is done in the political realm. So you say, brother, I think we need to vote. I think that we need to be real active in the political process. We can change the course of America by voting. No, you can't. What God has set in order is going to come to pass. So if we could just get rid of that dirty, rotten scoundrel Obama, wouldn't mean anything. The principalities are still there controlling things. 
and God is controlling the principalities. You see? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. If you could get rid of Obama, it's not going to take away the principality that controls him. See? God has everything under his control. And the reason that you have wicked politicians is because the people in the country are wicked and they're getting what they deserve. That's why. You can't vote out Obama and get in a great Republican that's going to turn America back to the Constitution or bring back the gold standard and we'll reinstitute. You know, It's not going to happen. God is not going to bless a nation that has given itself over to sodomy, given itself over to pornography, given itself over to abortion, given all this wickedness and messed with his word. All these new versions will bring a curse, 100% guarantee, curse from God upon a nation. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. God will not bless a nation like America. And, and the way that he will punish it is to allow these principalities to control the leaders to destroy the nation. You say, why should we be in subjection to them then? We'll get back to that. Now let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Back towards the beginning of your Bible. You say, uh, what's the truth that we've learned so far here? The truth that you can learn and you can mark it down and it's absolute truth cannot be changed. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Absolute truth is every sing single politician out there is influenced by spiritual forces from heavenly places. Okay, in heavenly places there, I should say. Every politician is influenced by these powers, these principalities. Every single one of them. I'm going to show you an interesting thing here. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14 through 16. Okay, it says here, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Huh. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. Okay. Now, if you're simplistic in your mindset and, a, and you have a, you're trying to find a loophole to get rid of the Bible, you know, like a lot of people do to justify their sin, what you'll do is you'll say, see, an e it's an evil spirit from God, so that proves that God must be evil. Well, if you're a, a simple-minded buffoon, then yeah, you might come up with that. But you see, if you understand the Bible and understand that God controls everything by Jesus Christ, by him all things consist. Everything in the universe is subservient to our God. So therefore, an evil spirit has to come from God. The evil spirit can't come upon a servant of God without God's permission. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? God is not evil in and of himself. But when people are wrong, when people are in sin, God has to send punishment. God will bring evil upon a nation. As long as those people are doing right, as long as it's a righteous nation, the Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Okay? As long as that nation is doing right, God will say, hey, you guys, stay back. Don't mess with that nation. Don't mess with those people. Be a good ruler. You know, there have been some good presidents in American history. Some godly men that have come in and done some great things. It's been a long time since we've had one, but the point is there have been some good political leaders in America. There have been some good political leaders in the UK. Okay, I mean, you study British history. I mean, there have been some good kings, some good queens, and some really rotten ones. You know, you had King James was a good king. He was good for the, you know, Commonwealth of England there. His son, King Charles I, was bad. He married a Catholic, you know, from France. She was a bad woman. He started to do some things. There was a civil war. The members of parliament rose up, overthrew the king, beheaded him because he was a traitor. He was going back to the Catholic Church after his father, King James I, had said no future king or queen can be Catholic. You know, you're to defend the Church of England and, and everything. And he goes 
marries a Catholic, and he starts to make, you know, political uh, deals and things with the Catholic Church. So they executed him. Oliver Cromwell was instated as the uh, Lord Protector for a number of years. After he died, uh, his son took over for a little bit. King Charles uh, II, King Charles I's son, came in, overthrew, I think it was Richard, Richard Cromwell. You know, I mean, you can study this history and you'll see this thing over and over again of good leaders, bad leaders. It's all through the Old Testament. Same thing. History repeats itself. Okay? But you'll see that thing there. And what's really going on? Well, you have a good king is influenced by, that's actually a, you know, a, a good political leader that wants to do God's will. God will keep those principalities away from him. And that nation, when it's doing right, God will say, okay, hey, I'll, keep, I'll give you a good leader. I'll give you a good ruler. One that you can follow. One that you can submit to. All right? But when those people start to be bad, the Lord says, hey, principalities, go on down there. Have a good time. You know, when a Christian starts to mess around, that's why Paul wrote in the New Testament, he said, Whom I have delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You'll see that thing there. A Christian will be protected from the devil unless they start to mess around in sin. And then the Lord just says, it. Go ahead. He'll restrain the principalities, he'll restrain the powers, he'll restrain Satan himself. But when a Christian starts to mess around, hey, Go on down there. They need to be punished. That's what's going on here. But I want you to notice two things there. Okay. As I said earlier, this evil spirit comes from God. It comes from God and it's controlled by God. The second thing, though, I want you to notice, and this is also very, very important. This will be important for a future upcoming sermon. And that is the evil spirit departs when the right kind of music is played. I don't think we understand sometimes, we take it for granted, how powerful music really is. Music is, in many ways, even more powerful than the Bible itself. You say, oh, come on, Brian, that's ridiculous. Really? Okay, try reading your Bible out loud while listening to old hymns, instrumental hymns or something like that. Try reading your Bible. Then turn on some heavy metal or rap or rock and roll or some kind of, with a driving beat and try reading your Bible. See how it goes. Music can influence people in an amazing ways. Totally amazing ways. And it's interesting too because if you read, I think it's Ezekiel chapter 28, where the Bible talks about Satan, that he was the anointed cherub. He actually had instruments as part of his body. Does Satan know about music? Oh yes. Satan knows about music. It's one of his favorite tools. Very interesting. And you see controlling of spirits based upon music right here in our passage. Interesting. But uh, go to Proverbs 21, verse 1. I'll show you again another verse that talks about God is the one who controls politics. You start getting worried and you start saying, oh no, so-and-so got elected. We're in serious trouble. He's going to pass laws. You know, Obama wants to make these horrible laws and think, I don't even worry about that stuff anymore. I used to. You know, I used to think that the political process was something that we had control over. <laughs> what a joke. You know, absolute total joke. Uh, we can elect such and such into office. It, it always cracks me up because, you know, I'll give you a good example. Rand Paul, Ron Paul's uh, son. And it was like, oh, if we could just get another, you know, one of the Paul family in there, he'll be a good man. And he's, he's, you know, I remember there was this big controversy, you know, that, that uh, I think it was like he was against the Bilderbergers. And then like after he got elected, he went and actually went to a Bilderberger meeting, you know. And it's just like he's against the New World Order and he gets elected and he's for the New World Order and part of them now. It's all a scam, people. Wake up. You know, you have no hope of joining the, with the Republicans, joining with the Democrats, or whatever your political parties are in whatever country you're in, you have no hope of voting people out of office. You have no hope of the political process bringing back the country. That stuff is nonsense. It's fairy tales. Your only hope is found in the pages of the King James Bible. Let me show it to you. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Did you know God could take the most corrupt, wicked king and turn his heart and make him into a good king? 
if the people would repent, if the people get right with God. You say, well, is that going to happen? No. No. Why? Because prophecy is being fulfilled. But our job is not to restore America, bring back the republic. That's not our job. Our job is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, get people saved, turn people to righteousness. And that's what's going to preserve things until the rapture. You see, I believe that God has things that, I mean, He knows obviously what's going to happen. Nothing's going to be a surprise for God. But I believe that right now we have the option, if we just all say, forget it, prophecy's being fulfilled, I'm just going to go along with it, you know? I'm just not going to fight the mark of the beast technology and I'm going to go along with everything and all the corruption. I'm not going to speak against anything. I'm just going to yeah, forget it. It's all, you know, it's set in stone. I can't do anything about it. If we do that, I think things are going to get really, really bad for the body of Christ before the rapture happens. But if we continue to fight this thing and continue to get the truth out, continue to witness to people, I think that the Lord can actually hold off a lot of the really bad things from happening he has already done that, you know? And I think that he can hold it off until he takes us out of here. You know, people have this, this stupid notion that we as Christians should want to be persecuted because it'll make us stronger. It'll make you stronger, but, you know, you don't have to be persecuted to be made stronger. You can be made stronger by having personal revival in your own life. You aren't reading the Bible as much as you should? Start reading the Bible more. You aren't witnessing as much as you should? Start to witness more. You aren't praying as much as you should. All the things that you're supposed to do as a Christian, you can have personal revival in your own life. No, we're never going to have national revival, but you can have personal revival. You can get right with God and start doing things the Lord's way. See? But anyways, let's continue on here. I'm going to keep ranting. But uh, go back to Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Titus 3, 1. So we see now what principalities are. Principalities are the ones, and of course, if you want the ultimate example of a spiritual being controlling a man, a political ruler, just read Re uh, Revelation chapter 13. The dragon gives the Antichrist his seat and power and great authority. What's going on there? Satan is controlling the Antichrist. I remember uh, reading a book by J. Frank Norris. This one right here, actually. See, it's so handy to have my bookshelf back. This book right here about J. Frank Norris, and in this book, J. Frank Norris actually went to one of the rallies that Hitler had before he was really, you know, doing the whole, you know, going over and attacking different countries and things. And he went and he, his opinion of, of Adolf Hitler, J. Frank Norris said, this man is Satan incarnate in the flesh. And I believe in many ways that was true. Why? Look at some videos of Adolf Hitler sometime. Look at his eyes. Nobody's home inside that head of his. That guy was completely controlled by Satan. Just walking and talking, just a devil walking around. And if you want to study the whole Illuminati thing, you know, they say that Hitler reached the highest level of Illuminati, which is perfect possession. In other words, you don't even have a brain anymore. It's just devils that control you. Interesting. But uh, let's look at Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers... To obey magistrates. Oh, well, then we have to do whatever the politicians say, and those Germans that hid Jews in their homes were in sin, right? No, because you keep reading, it defines it. To be ready to every good work. Let me show you what I mean. Romans chapter 13. The Bible is something that uh, will define itself. All right. You don't need a whole lot of commentaries and a whole lot of other stuff. I mean, you can have commentaries. That's fine. I certainly have quite a few books here, and they help out. You know, I use them to, to further prove the Bible. But none of these books back here behind me overthrow the Bible. If one of these things says something contrary to the book, I cross the book out. I say, nope, sorry, <laughs> wrong, the Bible. But let's look here. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, you know, like the principalities. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Is that true? Yes. Even an evil spirit came from God back there in 1 Samuel upon King Saul. The powers that be are ordained of God, even the bad ones. 
You say, then we should submit to ourselves to him only in good works. Let's continue reading. Verse 2, Whosoever therefore resist, resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. I've talked about this thing in other studies, so I'm not going to get too deep into it here. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible says that you are supposed to be subservient to those that are in authority. Why? They're the minister of God to thee for good. Get a hold of that one. All right. A good, when you submit to a ruler, it's because they are being good and in line with scripture. All right. A good ruler will say, I'll give you a couple examples. A good ruler will say, um, you can have as many children as you want to have. A bad ruler will say, you can have two and then the rest have to be aborted. You say, wait a second here. No, no, no. I'm not going to kill my own children. Say, problem. I won't submit to that ruler. A good ruler will come along and he'll say, you can have whatever religious beliefs you want as long as you aren't hurting anybody. Okay? Physically, I'm saying. A bad ruler comes along and says, that's a hate crime. You're not allowed to speak against sodomites. Who are you going to follow? The bad ruler or the word of God? And it's interesting, too, because every 501c3 Babel building I've ever been into... Every single time I've heard them preach on this passage here, they'll read verses 1, 2, and then they skip down to verse 5. They skip the two verses, verses 3 and 4, that define the rulers that you're supposed to submit to. I wonder why that would be. Could it be because they are subservient to the very government that they should be warning people about? Oh, no, no. Nothing like that, Brian, you know, no, 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 you know, because here in America, we have the freedom of speech, brother, you know, we got the First Amendment, First Amendment right, you know. Uh, no, actually, if you sign up for uh, Section 501c3 under the IRS code, you give up your First Amendment right. Again, if you don't know about that stu subject, you need to study that. Um, 501c3 churches, you know, they're not really churches. Churches are the living body of Christ. But 501c3 buildings are not of God. They aren't. Why? Because of the, the restrictions that are put on you. You are not allowed to do or say anything that will affect public policy. I have videos documenting that from the IRS's website. All right? That's why it's very important to make sure that you are lined up with ministries that are non-501c3. And if you have a ministry out there that's ignorant on that issue... You should be able to go to them and should be able to present that information to them and they should say, whoa, wow, I didn't know that. We're getting out of that. Why? Because Jesus Christ is supposed to be the head of the church, not the IRS or the federal government. See? When the Bible says, go back to Titus, when the Bible says that you are to, get the exact wording here, I want to make sure I quote it right, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. It's not talking about every single, single thing that they say that you submit to it. That's not what's going on here. What it's saying is when it's a good work, to be ready to every good work. Okay? You are supposed to do those things. That's the way it is. Now look at verse 2. Let's continue on here. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. That's tough. That is difficult because a lot of times what we do is we see some rotten law that got passed and you say, that's stupid, Obama, that's stinking. You're not supposed to do that, all right? Why? Because it's not Obama that's making the decision. You understand? The principalities and powers. Interesting there, in verse 1 it says principalities and powers. Verse 2, to speak evil of no man. But the principalities and powers aren't men. You know, they're male you know, beings, but the point is, they're not physical men. But they're controlling physical men. 
See how that thing works out? But you see, we're supposed to be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. That doesn't mean you have to be some cowardly little sissy, some little milk toast or doormat that people get to walk over. It doesn't mean that. Study the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, don't read the Sermon on the Mount and not Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and the Sermon on the Mount about loving people, turning the other cheek and all that stuff, those things tie in together. It's the same man doing both things. And people tend to forget that. Jesus is the meek, mild, loving Savior, but he's not the guy that goes into the temple and drives people out with a whip that he made himself. And he's not the guy that's rebuking the religious leaders to their faces and calling them serpents and generation vipers and how can you escape the damnation of hell. It's the same man. We're supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to be Christ's representatives on the earth. There are times that, yes, you should be meek and gentle unto all men. There are other times you have to be a little rough. All right? And as you grow up in the Lord, as you mature in the things of the Lord, you'll know when those times are. But let's continue here. Go to the next page of my notes. I'm going to show you the thing about being gentle. Keep your hand there in Titus 3 because we're going to be coming right back to it. Just go a couple pages over to Titus, or, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. We're going to see how these verses here tie into Titus 3, verse 3. Okay, it says here, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. That's what a sinner does. They oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. A lost sinner is hurting themselves. Every single one of them. They are on a path of self-destruction. All of them. I don't care how rich they are. I don't care how influential they are, how powerful, how well-known, whatever. They are all on a course of self-destruction. Every single last one of them. We have something that they don't have. Let's go back to Titus. I'll show you this thing. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You know, one of the hardest things for you as a Christian is going to be to remember what you were like before you got saved. That's a hard thing sometimes because you change, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So when you get saved, a true conversion produces a changed life. And a lot of times you get so far down that path of sanctification, you begin to forget how big of an idiot you were before you got saved. And you run into these people out there that are big idiots themselves, and you say to yourself, what a, what a jerk, what a, what a fool, what a buffoon, you know. You start doing this thing, forgetting how you used to be. It talks about that there in verse 3. We ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Mm-hmm. Don't ever get so high and mighty that you forget that you are still a sinner saved by grace. You still have to remember that. You still should have a gentle, meek spirit there. All right? That's very important, and it's very difficult. All right? Because the flesh, a lot of times, will get very angry when people are mocking the Lord and whatever else. And, you know, sometimes you have to kick them. Yeah, I'm not saying that you just have to be this little milk toast. I'm not saying that. Sometimes you do have to be harsh with people. But never forget... You should have sympathy for them. Why? They're on their way to hell. Your very worst enemy, the people that attack you the most, are going to burn for all of eternity someday. And that should give you sorrow. You shouldn't go, ha, 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 you're going to burn. It should be a sorrowful thing. And, you know, you talk to people and things, we're going to see this a little bit later, but you start talking to people, they reject the Lord, reject the Lord, reject the Lord. Sorry, I can't help you. Go on to the next one. All right? Don't waste much time on people that have no desire for the Lord. But uh, let's continue here. Verse 4 and 5. Okay, so you see there how you were deceived as a sinner in verse 3. Now look at verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, 
not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. All right. Interesting how up in verse 3 you see all those bad things that you were as a lost person. Verses 4 and 5 there, it says He saved us. And it's not by you doing good works. It's not by you cleaning up your life. See, that's Lordship salvation when somebody says you have to clean up your life and then get saved. All right? That's Lordship salvation. That's a stupid system. It's heretical. All right? You come to God as a sinner understanding I'm going to have to change. And that's what lost people know. That's why most lost people reject Jesus Christ because they know it's going to mean a changed life. A lot of people do that. But uh, it says there in this verse two things. You have washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Let's look about that. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1 verse 5 and 6. We'll see what this washing is all about. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you're watching this and you're new and you don't really understand a lot of Bible doctrine and things, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood that was shed, that is the payment for your sins. Right? He died on the cross to pay for your sins. And that blood that was shed is what washes your sins away. Right? It doesn't mean that you have to go someplace and, and all of a sudden this blood just drops down on you and, and you're washed now and you're clean. No, it's spiritually speaking here. All right? But you see there, you are washed from your sins in his own blood. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says about God has purchased the church with his own blood. So that blood that was shed on the cross was God's blood. It was eternal blood. Why? Jesus Christ is God and always was God. You can see my video where I rebuked this false prophet, prophet uh, Martin Richling, because he was saying Jesus is a created being. If Jesus was a created being, then his blood's no different than ours. All right? No. The blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross was God's eternal blood. That's why it's able to wash away your sins. But now let's look about the thing of renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 13. There's a lot of very important things here going on in this passage. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 13. Let's read here. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay? So you're quickened by the Holy Ghost, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. All right? It's kind of like I've said in other studies. It's like having a remote control that has dead batteries in it. It has all the functions to be able to do things and turn things on and make things work. But unless it has batteries in it, it's not going to do anything. The Holy Ghost comes in and you're quickened. That remote now works. But let's continue here. Verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Interesting, because you compare that to Titus chapter 3. There, the verses we were just reading about that, you know, for we ourselves used to be like this. Same thing here. Very interesting. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Remember the thing there about obeying you know, the principalities and powers and things to be ready to every good work? We are created 
Uh, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Maybe it should say political activism. Uh-uh. Um, political office? No. Good works. That's what we're supposed to do. That's our job here as Christians on the earth. Continuing here, it says, Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In other words, the Jews there, the circumcision, the uncircumcision being Gentiles. Verse 12, That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ that washed your sins away is what now has made you a partaker in the promises that are going to come to the nation of Israel. We're going to see that as we continue here in the study. But now let's go back to Titus chapter 3. Titus 3 verses 6 and 7. It says here, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So there you see it, the thing of being made an heir. Ye were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, but now ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. See, we're brought into that thing. And we'll see that as we continue here. Um, Ephesians 2.19 You can keep your hand there in Titus chapter 3 if you haven't already, if you're not already doing that, because we're going to be coming back to it here before real long. Um, Ephesians 2 and verse 19 says here, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. See, it all ties together there. We were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. Now we are fellow citizens. Okay, specifically so of New Jerusalem. All right, that's really where we're going to be in eternity. All right, New Jerusalem, the, he the heavenly city. We're going to be part of that city. All right, but uh, go to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, uh, verses 14 through 18. Okay, it says here, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we, ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay? Are you going to suffer for doing good works? Yeah. If you haven't figured that out yet, yeah, you will. All right? Suffering is not, you know, you don't have to, you know, I'm going to take myself here and pinch my hand. Ow! Okay, boy, I just inherited some more things in the millennial kingdom. You know, I'm going to punch myself in the face a few times here. I suffered some more. So that's Catholic, okay? And I'm not kidding about that either. I mean, the Catholics do do things like that. I mean, they, they whip themselves. They flagellate themselves. They wear hair shirts. They wear, you know, these little belts with nails and spikes on them and stuff. Crazy. They'll crawl on their knees, their bare knees, up to the idol of Mary up in front of the cathedral and pray to it and do their thing and stuff like this. You know, curse themselves, you know. They'll do all kinds of things to try and merit that suffering to earn salvation. That's foolish, very foolish. Uh, your suffering in this life will come as a result of you doing good works for the Lord, of you taking stands for His Word, of you witnessing to friends and family. You will suffer for it. And let me tell you something, if you ever get into ministry, if the Lord ever calls you into full-time suffer or full-time ministry, <laughs> kind of giving it away, you know, you're going to have full-time suffering. Full-time ministry means full-time suffering. You will not believe how often times you are attacked spiritually, how times, many times you are getting sick, how you have people, 
you know, I heard, uh, I think it was Dr. Ruckman said the one time about how that, you know, you have, you know, when you are in a true ministry of the Lord, you'll experience all of the disciples. You'll have disciples like John, whom Jesus loved, ones, you know, fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord that you just, you love them. They're there for you all the time. They're praying for you. They're, they just have that sensitive spirit and they just they know exactly what to say to encourage you to keep to lift your spirits up then you'll have your peters you know those disciples of yours that uh you know that follow the ministry and they'll go out there and they'll say really rash stupid things to make you look bad you know and you'll have judas iscariots as well people that you thought were your friends and they'll just go whoop and flip right around and they will stab you in the back just as quick as look at you you will experience all the 12 disciples very interesting. That's part of suffering. That's part of what happens when you start to serve the Lord. And I'll tell you what, you know, a lot of people think it's an easy thing to be in full-time ministry. I hope the Lord puts you in full-time ministry so you get a little taste of it. I hope you get to try it. See how easy it is just to write sermons and preach sermons and stuff. Oh, you're sitting in front of the camera shooting your mouth off. I'd like to see you try it, you know. Some of these people, I'll tell you what, they know everything and yet have experienced nothing. It's amazing how they can do that. But uh, go back to Titus 3, verse 8. Titus 3, verse 8 says here, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. There you see that good works again. These things are good and profitable unto men. Okay? Why do you have to be careful to maintain good works? Well, to keep yourself saved. So you can die in a state of belief, a state of grace, whichever way you want to be. If you're Baptist, it's a state of belief. If you're Catholic, it's a state of grace. You know, two heads of the same corrupt coin. No, that's not what's going on here. This has nothing to do with your salvation, eternal salvation. Okay? What's going on here is the reason you have to be careful to maintain good works is so that when you die, you have rewards. If you suffer, you shall also reign with him. See? But if you mess around with the flesh, you're going to lose millennial inheritance. You know, and there's a lot of debate back and forth what's going to happen to a carnal Christian that didn't suffer for the Lord. You know, and I know there's a uh, Joey Faust, I think, that teaches that, that carnal Christians actually go to hell for the millennial kingdom and burn for a thousand years. And it's like, okay, so part of the body of Christ is in hell burning. For the thousand years, the other parts on the earth ruling, reigning with Christ. I'm sorry, but that's a stupid theory. Um, yes, it's scary, you know, and might spur people to righteousness, but uh, that's not the way you do it. Okay, you don't twist Scripture to scare people into righteousness. It doesn't work. Um, what happens to a Christian that's that's a carnal Christian that messes around with the flesh? Um, well, they're going to lose millennial inheritance, and maybe they'll be you know, down here on the earth, scrubbing toilets out or something for a thousand years. I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe they stay up in heaven. There are theories about that, too. There's a lot of different, you know, teaching on that subject. And uh, interesting thing, but I don't think that you can be totally 100% dogmatic on it. But um, as to what exactly happens to one of those types of people, not really sure. But I want to show you here a good example of this thing of being careful to maintain good works. All right, go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 2 through 4. Actually, we'll start at verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Okay, it says here, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business." But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Okay, what was going on there? Here you have the twelve, okay, those twelve disciples there. And these guys are out there. They're doing very important work for the Lord. 
And what you have is you still have this thing of a lot of these Jews, even though they were saved, they still had that thing of the Gentile dogs, just like, hey, you know, these Gentiles, yeah, okay, they're saved, praise the Lord, whatever, but, you know, let's take care of our widows before we take care of their widows. And it was making some of these Grecians mad. And they're going, hey, whoa, wait a second here. We're supposed to be brethren. Why aren't you taking care of our widows? What's the favoritism here all about? And it was starting to make problems. And it's like these 12 disciples are going, look, we have important work to do here. We're going to pick out some younger men, some other men here that are faithful, and we will appoint them over that business so that we can stay in the ministry that we have, the important ministry. All right? That's and this, for this same exact cause is the reason I recently said I have to cut out the email thing. Why? Because this here, the ministry of the Word, reviewing books, reviewing Bibles, preaching the Word, you know, this is what I need to dedicate myself to. And taking care of the body of Christ through emailing and counseling and stuff like that, I can't do that. I cannot separate myself into these two different things. All right? It takes an incredible amount of work to put together these videos. And people have no idea. Again, you know, I see these people, they'll make comments, oh, you know, you're lazy, whatever. I look at their channel, they don't even put up videos. You know, I mean, you're really qualified to question me, you know. But what's going on here is I need to look out and I need to say, okay, what are the areas where I can be most fruitful? What are the areas where the Lord can use my abilities the most? And that's in video production. Let me just put it to you this way. Let's say I have one person and they email me a question about the subject of why does the King James Bible say itself, referring to the Holy Spirit, and others say himself. Is the King James Bible an error? Now I can take my time and I can write out all the answers and things like that to that one individual. Or I can have that same person write and say, hey, could you do a video on this? Ah, see, now I can make that same answer available to the whole body of Christ. Why? God has given me the ability through video to reach out to people all over the world. That's my ministry. And you say, well, what are you going to do about the sheep that, you know, the people that need the counseling? Hey, if you have been watching these videos and you've learned the Bible and you know the Bible well, what are you doing for the Lord? Why don't you take up that ministry? Hey, you know what you can do? Take my videos from off of my channel, because nothing is copyrighted. Take my videos, start your own YouTube channel. You don't even have to put yourself out there. Start your own YouTube channel and say, I am a fellow helper, a fellow minister with Brian Denlinger, and I can answer your emails. And then when you start to get some people writing to you, if you're an older Christian, if you are somebody who's been saved for a long time and could really genuinely help members of the body of Christ, why don't you do that? Why don't you field some of these emails? right? Why don't you go to the ministration of the saints there, the, the taking care, counseling people, so I can give myself continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word? That's what's going on here. Right? I'm not trying to neglect people and whatever. I mean, people need to be realistic. How am I supposed to stay in contact with thousands of people? I mean, one week alone, I had over a thousand emails. But I'm supposed to take my time and answer every single one of them. Sure, yeah, you know. And give me a second here, I'm going to run outside and fly across the, you know, the, the, the state here and get some food at the grocery store and fly back in two seconds. Because I'm Superman. You know, we have a life outside of the ministry too. I mean, we don't live in some kind of a magical place where I just say, food appear and food appears and, and walls be fixed and they're fixed. You know, there's a lot of work to do here. Time is very precious. And I need to look at what the Lord wants me to do and say, okay, that's going to produce the most fruit. Therefore, I have to give myself continually to that thing whatever it is. And for me, it is video ministry, teaching and preaching of the Word of God. I have to study for that. It takes time. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. 